Okay, how's it going on? So, uh, one second. So we're gonna read some Karl Marx today. Pull the microphone in here. Okay, so we're gonna read <clears throat> some Karl Marx. This was released in the People's Paper in 1853. This is the Duchess of Sutherland and slavery. Let's go ahead and get into this. This is going to be about some uh, Scotch Gaelic history. <coughs> Karl Marx, <clears throat> reading the great thinkers, the great revolutionary thinkers, from Lenin to Stalin to Marx and Engels and Mao, it's like, you know, there's a lot of historical lessons in these things. It's very, uh, you learn, it's another thing. You, you Not only do you, you know, <clears throat> you when it comes to philosophy, you know, and economy, in political science and even war science but you also get you know history lessons and that's what's a very crucial point that holds all those things together is, is the history that makes them right so um, we're gonna go ahead and um, and uh, get into this this is the Duchess of Sutherland and slavery so this is London Friday January 21st 1853 published in the People's Paper, number 45. During the present momentary slackness in political affairs, the address of the Stafford House Assembly of Ladies to their sisters in America upon the subject of the slavery of black people and the, quote, affectionate and Christian address of many thousands of the women in the United States of the United States of America to their sisters, the women of England, end quote, upon white slavery, have proved a godsend to the press, not one of the British papers was ever struck by the circumstance that the Stafford House Assembly took place at the palace under the presidency of the Duchess of Sutherland. And yet the names of Stafford and Sutherland should have been sufficient to class the philanthropy of the British aristocracy, a philanthropy which chooses its objects as far distant from home as possible, and rather on that than on the side of the ocean. The history of the wealth of the Sutherland family is the history of the ruin and of the expropriation of the Scotch Gaelic population from its native soil. As far back as the 10th century, the Danes had landed in Scotland, conquered the plains of Caithness, and driven back the Aborigines into the mountains. Moir Fir Chattai, as he was called in Gaelic, or the, quote, great man of Sutherland, end quote, had always found his companions in arms ready to defend him at risk of their lives against all his enemies. Danes or Scots, foreigners or natives. After the revolution, which drove the Stuarts from Britain, private feuds among the petty chieftains of Scotland became less and less frequent, and the British kings, in order to keep up at least a semblance of dominion on these remote districts, encouraged the levying of family regiments among the chieftains, a system by which these lairds were enabled to combine modern military establishments with the ancient clan system in such a manner as to support one by the other. Now, in order to distinctly appreciate the usurpation subsequently carried out, we must first properly understand what the clan meant. The clan belonged to a form of social existence, which, in the scale of historical development, stands a full degree below the feudal state, vis the patriarchal state of society. Clan in Gaelic, uh, it says K-L-A-E-N, it's a Gaelic word. In Gaelic means children. And the interesting, Marx knew some Gaelic. <laughs> you know, he's, he's spoken Gaelic quite a bit in here. Every one of the usages and traditions of the Scottish Gales reposes upon the supposition that the members of the clan belong to one of the same family. The, quote, great man, end quote, the chieftain of the clan, is on the one hand quite as arbitrary, on the other, on the other quite as confined in his power, by consanguinity, etc., as every, or, I'm not sure what this is, when it's an and sign and a C at the end, as every father of a family. To the clan, the family belonged the district where it had established itself, exactly as in Russia. The land occupied by a community of peasants belongs not to the individual peasants, but to the community. Thus, the district was the common property of the family. There could be no more question under the system of private property in the modern sense of the word than there could be of comparing the social existence of the members of the clan to that of individuals living in the midst of our modern society. The division and subdivision of the land corresponded to the military functions of the single members of the clan, according to their military abilities. <clears throat> the chieftain entrusted to them the several allotments, canceled or enlarged, 
according to his pleasure the tenors of the individual officers. And these officers again distributed to their vassals and under vassals every separate plot of land. But the district at large always remained the property of the clan, and however the claims of individuals might vary, the tenure remained the same, nor were the contributions for the common defense or the tribute for the laird, who at once was leader in battle and chief magistrate in peace, ever increased. Upon the whole, every plot of land was cultivated by the same family from generation to generation, under fixed imposts. These imposts were insignificant, and were a tribute by which the supremacy of the, quote, great man and of his officers was acknowledged than a rent of land in a modern sense or a source of revenue. The officers directly subordinate to the great man were called taxmen, and the district entrusted to their care tack. Under then were placed inferior officers at the head of every hamlet, and under these stood the peasantry. Thus you see the clan is nothing but a family organized in a military manner, quite as little defined by laws, just as closely hemmed in by traditions as in, as in, as any family. But the land is the property of the family, in the midst of which differences of rank, in spite of consanguinity, do prevail as well as in all the ancient Asiatic family communities. The first usurpation took place after the expulsion of the Stuarts, by the establishment of the family regiments. From that moment, pay became the principal source of revenue of the great man, the Muir Fier Chatai, entangled in the dissipation of the court of London. He tried to squeeze as much money as possible out of his officers, and they applied the same system of their inferiors. The ancient tribute was transformed into fixed money contracts. In one respect, these contracts constituted a progress by fixing the traditional imposts. In another respect, they were a usurpation, inasmuch as the great man now took the position of landlord toward the taxman, who again took toward the peasantry, that of farmers. And as the great men now required money no less than the taxman, a production not only for direct consumption, but for export and exchange also became necessary. The system of national production had to be changed. The hands superseded by this change had to be got rid of. Population therefore decreased, but that it as yet was kept up in a certain manner, and that man in the 18th century was not yet openly sacrificed in that revenue. We see from a passage in Stuart, a Scotch political economist whose work was published 10 years before Adam Smith's, where it says, Volume 1, Chapter 16, quote, the rent of these lands is very trifling compared to their extent, but compared to the number of mouths which a farm maintains, it will perhaps be found that a plot of land in the highlands of Scotland feeds ten times more people than a farm of the same extent in the richest provinces. End quote. That even in the beginnings of the 19th century the rental imposts were very small is shown by the work of Mr. Locke, 1820, steward of the Countless of Sutherland. Mr. Locke is L-O-C-H. I don't think this is John Locke, uh, who was also Scottish, you, you know, um, uh, was uh, is considered the founder of, founder of liberalism. But uh, I don't think this is, I mean, because it's, it's L-O-C-H and John Locke's last name is, I've always seen it spelled L-O-C-K-E. So anyway, the steward of the Countess of Sutherland is directed the improvements on her estates. He gives, for instance, the rental of the Kentra de Well estate for 1811 from which it appears that up to then every family was obliged to pay a yearly impost of a few shillings in money, a few fowls, and some days work at the highest. It was only after 1811 that the ultimate and real usurpation was enacted, the forcible transformation of clan property into the private property in the modern sense of the chief. The person who stood at the head of this economical revolution was a female, Mehemet Ali, who well digested her Malthus, the Countess of Sutherland, alias Marchionis of Stafford. Let us first state that the ancestors of the Marchionis of Stafford were the great men of the most northern part of Scotland, of very near three quarters of Sutherlandshire. This country is more extensive than many French departments or small German principalities. When the Countess of Sutherland inherited these estates, which she afterward brought to her husband, the Marquis of Stafford, afterward Duke of Sutherland, the population of them was already reduced to 15,000. My Lady Countess resolved upon a radical economical reform and determined upon transforming the whole tract of country into sheep walks. From 1814 to 1820, these 15,000 inhabitants, about 3,000 families, were systematically expelled and exterminated. All their villages were demolished and burned down, and all their fields converted into pasturage. British soldiers were commanded for this execution, and came to blows with the natives. 
An old woman refusing to quit her to quit her hut was burned in the flames was burned in the flames of it. Thus my lady countess appropriated to herself seven hundred ninety four thousand acres of land, which from the which from time immemorial had belonged to the clan. In the exuberance of her generosity she allotted to the expelled natives about six thousand acres, two acres per family. These six thousand acres had been lying waste until then. They brought no revenue to the proprietors. The countess was generous enough to sell the acre at two shillings to two s sixty on an average to the clanmen who for centuries past had shed their blood for her for her family. The whole of the unrightfully appropriated clan land she divided into twenty nine large sheep farms, each of them inhabited by one single family, mostly English farm laborers and in eighteen twenty one the fifteen thousand gales had already been superseded by one hundred and thirty one thousand sheep. A portion of the aborigines had been thrown upon the seashore and attempted to live by fishing. They became amphibious and, as an English author says, lived half on land and half on water. After all, did not live upon both. And after all, did not live upon both. Sismondi, in his Atutis Socialis, observes with regard to the expropriation of the gales from Sutherlandshire, an example which by, which, by the by, was imitated by other great men of Scotland. Quote, the large extent of signorial dom domains is not a circumstance peculiar to Britain. In the whole empire of Charlemagne, the whole Occident entire provinces were usurped by the warlike chiefs, who had them cultivated for their own account by the vanquished, and sometimes by their own companions in arms. During the ninth and 10th centuries, the counties of Maine and Poto were for the counts of these provinces, rather three large estates than principalities. Switzerland, which in so many sus respects resemble Scotland, was at, the time, was at that time divided among a small number of seigneurs. If the Counts of Kyberg, of Lindsberg, or, Halsberg, or Habsburg, of Gruyeres had been protected by British laws, they would have been in the same position as the Earls of Sutherland. Some of them would perhaps, would perhaps have had the same taste for improvement as the Marchioness of Stafford, and more than one republic might have disappeared from the Alps in order to make room for flocks of sheep. Not the most despotic monarch in Germany would be allowed to attempt anything of the sort. End quote. Mr. Locke, in his defense of the Countess of Sutherland, 1820, replies to the above as follows quote, Why should there be made an exception to the rule adopted in every other case, just for this particular case? Why should the absolute authority of the landlord over his land be sacrificed to the public interest and to motives which concern the public only? End quote. And why then should the slaveholders in the southern states of North America sacrifice their private interests to the philanthropic grimaces of Her Grace, the Duchess of Sutherland? The British aristocracy, who have everywhere superseded man by bullocks and sheep, will in a future not very distant be superseded in turn by these useful animals. The process of clearing estates, which in Scotland we have just now described, was carried out in England in the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries. Thomas Morris already complains of it in the beginning of the 16th century. It was performed in Scotland in the beginning of the 19th, and in Ireland it is now in full progress. The noble Viscount Palmerston, too, some years ago, cleared of men his property in Ireland, exactly in the manner described above. If of any property it ever was true that it was robbery, it is literally true of the property of the British aristocracy. Robbery of church property, robbery of commons, fraudulent transformation accompanied by murder of feudal and patriarchal property into private property. These are the titles of British aristocrats to their possessions. And what services in this latter process were performed by a servile class of lawyers? You may see from an English lawyer of the last century, Dalrymple, who, in his history of feudal property, very naively proves that every law or deed concerning property was interpreted by the lawyers in England. When the middle class rose in wealth in favor of the middle class in Scotland, where the nobility enriched themselves in the favor of the nobility, in either case, it was interpreted in a sense hostile to the people. The above Turkish reform by the Countess of Sutherland was justifiable, at least from a Malthusian point of view. Other Scottish noblemen went further, having superseded human beings by sheep. They superseded sheep by game, and the pasture grounds by forests. At the head of these was the Duke of Athol. Quote, After the conquest of the Norman kings of forested large portions of the soil of England, in much the same way as the landlords here are now doing with the highlands. <clears throat> in, in quote. R. Summers, Letters on the Highlands, Letters, Letters on the Highlands, 1848. 
As for a large number of the human beings expelled to make room for the game of the Duke of Athal, and the sheep of the Countess of Sutherland, where did they fly to? Where did they find a home? In the United States of America. The enemy of British wage slavery has a right to condemn the slavery of black people. A Duchess of Sutherland, a Duke of Athal, a Manchester cotton lord, never. Okay, that was uh, The Duchess of Sutherland and Slavery by Karl Marx. Um... 1853 this is the uh, written in the people's paper so yeah thank y'all for tuning in you know Facebook Twitter uh, Tumblr medium all these are Marxist song. also YouTube is probably where you're hearing this follow me there or subscribe um, and hit the notification bell we're gonna be having a lot of these out please use them share these around share these around you know uh, get things around and let people hear them you know Get, get at me hit me up too you know I'm more than happy to get to talk whenever y'all want hit me up please if I physically can I certainly will so uh yeah thank y'all y'all have a great day and the data goi